supposed to be a, another formal meeting. In fact, this wasn't even on the schedule, right? So uh, how many are still sitting here <laughs> because you're bored? No, not because you're bored, but because, uh, because you specifically want to discuss wrath. Because so I, I, we could do anything else that you want, but I, okay. Um, and and <clears throat> it's kind of valuable to do that, and let's do, let's do this. I'm going to, instead of turning it into a really long sort of story explanation, I, I'm going to just put a couple of pieces on the board to get the gist of it there, and then let's, let's work on your questions or your thoughts on it. And, and actually, let me give you, instead of just one or two references, uh, let me give you a bunch, right? So a little different than, you know, when we do a large church service, we kind of got to go fast and we got to get it out there real quick. But let's, let's try to do this a little different than that. <clears throat> um, let me think here. We put, you know, at Sabbath school there, we put, let me just get my references ready here. Okay, yep, I'm on it. Um, we put, and for Sabbath school, we got this far with love, forgiveness, healing, wrath, or love, forgiveness, healing. So let me put those back up here. And those are so much fun to do. It is easy to get uh, stuck on just working on those. Forgiveness. But... <clears throat> You understand why we do this. Uh, did I get something wrong? I left out a couple letters. <laughs> For G-I-V. You see that? I'm trying to talk and spell at the same time. And I can't spell, I can't spell anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no good. <laughs> there we go. And healing. The reason we do this around and around, which actually is good for us, is because... Every single one of these that we work on is retesting the first one. I mean, God was right when he just said, God is love. And that, that could have been the total end of the explanation. And it would have been totally true. But once the darkness comes, right, once the lies and the deceptions start, all of a sudden it's got to be reset in many, many, many ways. That's why it says in many and various ways. He spoke to us by the prophets of old, and most importantly, that's where he, it's going in Hebrews, he spoke to us by his son. So it's good for us to, to go through this and then ask the question and go through it again. So, so I hope you, you know, nobody feels like this is a problem to keep going around this. Uh, so we worked on this idea of unconditional love, unconditional forgiveness. I, I, I'm actually going to go home and work some more on the thought the pastor brought up <laughs> in my head. I, I've been thinking about that actually during lunch here a little bit. I, this, this one here, what, we, what I mean with conditional is not that God has any sort of uh, withholding from us, but I, I got to figure out how to work that one in because I'm, I'm, I'm liking what he said. Do you, would you remember what he said? That, that healing is also unconditional, and I think what he's talking about is in the sense of God is not asking for some payment to get it, right? He's not asking, well, when you jump through these four hoops, then maybe I'll heal you. And again, we're talking spiritual healing, right? Um, so that's good. That's important to bring in. I, I got to work on how to maybe bring that in stronger. But, but on the other hand, with this conditional idea, it's only to say that he won't force it upon us. He's not going to walk around and say, like it or not, you're healed, right? He, he wants to bring this healing for all of us. But, but he wants us, he wants to work in our hearts according to our wanting him to work in our heart. I, Sister White's uh, statement of that would be according to our willingness, right? So that, that's kind of an important piece to understand that he's not, he's not you know, forcing himself on people. I know that he has power to do that. Like, I kind of like this story where King Saul, before he's king, and, and he's anointed, you know, with the ceremony that Samuel did, and then, uh, man, he just, you know, gets knocked off his horse or whatever, gets off his horse, and, and he's prophesying for three days. And, and what I see in that story is that he was having a revelation of God. And, and, and it was coming into his mind and into his heart, things that he didn't even understand before, and it was coming out of his mouth. That's, that's what it was that he was prophesying. Saul, who became Paul? Yeah, the interesting thing with King Saul, though, is that King Saul got this, this like, boom, I'm just coming on you, and you're going to get it, meaning understand it. And then God pulls back, 
And he says, now, now, if you don't want it, I'm not just going to keep that going. I'm not going to force myself on you. And we see, we see King Saul reject, reject, reject for his whole career. And at the end of his career, God does it again. To me, that's like the fire came down from heaven, the revelation of God for the wicked at the end. He comes on Saul again for three days Saul prophesies. And this is just before he goes to the witch of Endor, right? So, so you see God can do it. He can come on and just sort of um, take over. But it's not according to his character to do that for the purposes of permanency. He does it for the purpose of revelation so we can see and comprehend. But then he says, that's what I want to give you. Can I? Right? That, that's an amazing, gracious God. But yet with all power, right? He can just overthrow everything about us and, 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 and just sort of fill up our, our understanding. So yeah, thoughts? The gift he's given us is choice. And he, oh. <laughs> the gift of choice, and he will never take that away. That is such a beautiful important, gift. Yeah. It's an important gift. So he could just wipe us out, take our breath away in the morning, never wake up. You know, or he the... could just take over every heart and fill us by force with the Spirit of God, and you have no choice. Right? He could, but he won't. According to his character, though, he will not. You're right. Thoughts, Ken? No. <clears throat> I struggled a lot with um, God and free will and choice and all that in regarding the issues I've had with my two sons and uh, the story he gave me to kind of clarify it and give me some peace about it was the story of Jacob heading back to his hometown he was pursued by basically two armies right mm -hmm. Laban's coming from behind him he's pissed mm -hmm. stated purpose is I'm going to kill him mm -hmm. Esau his brother's coming from the other way now he's not coming home and Esau is a little different game than Laban. Esau's <laughs> got trained men. Yeah. This isn't just your shepherds with sticks. sticks. Yeah. This, these are trained men. And Esau's stated purpose is, I'm going to kill him. Mm -hmm. He's not coming home. And so then we have that night where Jacob, you know, is busy, right? He's struggling with Christ. Right. <clears throat> and so Jacob's unaware of the other two stories taking place, which is they're given dreams. Esau specifically, it's very clearly laid out that Esau received a dream. And in the dream he saw, you know, how Jacob's life hasn't been all that great. And he right. was gone when his mom died. And Esau was there and, you know, that whole thing. And anyway, Laban gets up in the morning and says, you know what, we're going home. Esau gets up in the morning, goes out to his men and says, we're no longer an attack force, we are now Change of mission. a security force. <laughs> and we're going to, I'm embracing my brother, and we're going to protect him. Of course, Jacob doesn't know this, so he does the split up and divide, and, you know, only right. half of us die, and that, you know, kind of thing. Um, but there, there were two men who had stated their will very unequivocally. I'm going to kill him. Mm -hmm. And in one night, it's changed. So I don't think will is really that big of an issue. <laughs> for God so much, and, and, and that's where I kind of want to go with what the pastor said earlier. You know, we talk about unconditional love and unconditional forgiveness, we're all for it, we're mm -hmm. all gung-ho. So what's changing when we get to healing? Well, it's that little piece, which we were just talking about, choice, but really self. Because we might pick something that God isn't even interested in, right? We might ask God, you know, I, I want this gone because I want to look better. Right. You know, I, I, this makes me look kind of bad to my fellow Christians here. So you and I need to work on this. Whereas God knows what he really needs to work on is something that's going to keep me out of the kingdom that's unseen and secret. That's right. So, you know, even in the choosing of healing, if we're really giving up control, it is a complete surrender that's of right. self. And that's why the condition all of a sudden shows up because we're still wanting it to be this thing of, well, but I want the right thing. That's what right. Do you do? <laughs> That's right. Pastor wants to add to that. It's a messy subject. <laughs> it's a messy subject. It, it really is because there's a lot of factors to this. 
there's the factor of, you know, like I said earlier, Jesus, I believe, wants to heal everyone. Yep. And he clearly showed that when he went through towns, he'd walk out of towns and they were all healed. And I'm sure not everybody had great faith. I'm sure it wasn't all those things. Good point. He'd, he'd leave it. So as far as the issue goes, I believe Jesus wants to heal everyone. But there is a practicality to this whole thing, too. And that is the fact that as I visit with people, like, for instance, somebody catches a, a flu. I've had people come to me and say, Bible says you're sick, call the elders and anoint them. And I'm, and I'm going, for a flu? But yet on the other hand, Jesus did heal the one, you know, uh, Peter's mom, yep. you know, mother-in-law, and, and, and serve her, but did, they didn't call the elders to anoint her. And so, you know, I've, I've wrestled back and forth this whole thing of healing, and I think that there's a lot of facets to healing that we have to understand. There are things that we do to ourselves that cause us a condition that we have. And, and, I, and I kind of, I, I'm going to kind of weave this together. Give me, just give me a moment to kind of, because I, I, I can't put an exact formula or, or thought to it. So I'm just going to kind of spill out where I'm coming from on this. And then you guys can draw your own conclusion. But there are some statements of Ellen White not written. And I also had the privilege of going into a vault and reading a whole bunch of letters that were unpublished. And one of the things I did is I studied healing when I was back at seminary because it was a subject I've struggled with for a very long uh, time. Are we talking physical healing? Physical healing, okay. as well as spiritual healing. Oh, both. both. Okay. okay. And, but mainly the physical is what I was looking at because I've wrestled with, you know, you see these spiritual healers, you know, and Jesus right. talks about, you know, he gave his disciples power. They went out and did the same thing. And I look at our church and I didn't see exactly the same things transpiring. And so I had a lot of questions. Um... I've worked through that aspect of the spiritual healers because there are some things that just ain't right there, okay? But when I look at it, I'm still saying, what is it about this healing? Why don't we see the manifestations as prolific as what Christ did when he was on earth? Very clearly, he gave the things to his disciples to do that. Um, as I begin to read through the statements of Ellen White and through some of those letters to people who were sick, what I discovered was is that she takes on a perspective that's very interesting. She writes to the people and she says, when you pray for healing, be sure before you pray that you've done everything you can to correct the scenario. Now, that seems to almost, it sounds like almost righteous is by works, but I, <laughs> let me finish. Let me keep going with it, and I think it'll, it'll begin to become clear. She also says, like with prayer, do everything in your power to make that prayer come true if, when you pray for it. Okay, so there's, there's a part that we play in this that we don't just sit back and say, hey, God, you know, land a job on top of me and, and do all this and this and this. I want a nice house, a car, and I expect tomorrow <laughs> that you open up the door and there it will be. There, there seems to be a part that we have to play in this, and the healing seems to be part of that because she says when you, in a variety of different ways, she said to people, when you pray for healing, make sure that you're not doing something in your lifestyle that's going to be harming you that maybe actually have caused you to fall into a, a, a place of sickness. You need to let go of those things before you start praying for healing because why would God heal somebody that say that has cirrhosis of the liver while they're still taking the drink? God's not going to do that. She was very clear. God is not going to heal you in an area that you are damaging yourself just in, and allow you to keep doing it so you just do it all over again. So there seems to be a part to play that we have in the healing process. And, and here's where I've come to. I've come to the aspect of understanding that if we're asking God to do something, not that he doesn't want to do it, he wants to do it. But if we're asking God to do something that's going to change where I am right now in the state that I am, which is leading towards death, because we're all dying technically, we start dying the moment we're born. And yet, and yet, I'm asking God to change that so that I can keep living longer or a better, higher quality life, even though in the end, in a few more years or whatever, I'm going to probably die anyway. Okay, so I'm asking God to change reality. If I'm doing that, then I need to make sure that I have that walk with God that warrants a change. And she says over and over again to remind God of the service you serve him when you're asking for healing. So, you know, I've, I've been serving you, God, for 10 years. And acknowledge the fact that you want to continue being able to serve him and, and put it before him. 
And so it's, it's just interesting, the little pieces that come with it. And like I said, I don't have anything that says, <laughs> I got it all figured out. I'm just saying, this seems These to be... These are interesting pieces. It's interesting pieces of that. If we talk about healing, interesting pieces. And I know with the soul, it's somewhat like that. If, if I'm... I can't just simply say, Lord, I want to have a changed heart and then turn right around and pursue completely the opposite direction. The Bible's very clear. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added. There seems to be the sense of there's a part of us that has to, we may not be able to overcome it. We may not be able to do much with it, but we need to actually turn to God. We may not have anything more than just lift our eyes to God and that's it, but there seems to be a cooperative aspect of the humanity with the divinity. And this, of course, is the, the discussion that we've been working on since 1888, <laughs> right? Is what is the formula? <laughs> what, what is the formula for that a little cooperative part, right? Um, and and I, I tend to resist getting into uh, sort of little semantical things, but when we look at stories, like for instance, uh, he's talking about the idea of physical healing and how if we don't remove from our lives the things that are causing the physical problem, and then we just pray for healing. So if we apply that to spiritual healing alone, because really I put this word up here, to talk about spiritual healing, but he's bringing up a pattern, and so I'm going to ask you a question. Where do you see Jesus using that pattern when he talks to people about their spiritual healing? Can you think of any? The pattern of, you also need to be part of this removing these problems from your life. Well, I immediately thought of the rich young rulers discussion. The go sell all you have. Yeah. Okay, there's one. Uh, because he comes to Jesus, he's wanting to know how to get in the kingdom, Jesus knows the problem is, is this man still thinks that, that it has some with his good track record, right? He doesn't understand that his, his heart and his soul is so palsied, so, so diseased, right, that he can't even see straight. So Jesus drops the big one on him and says, well, here's what you have to do if you're going to fix this. Now, Jesus was hoping that the man was going to respond with, wait, wait, wait a minute. If that's true, that, I don't even want to do that. How will I ever be saved? And if the man had said that, what would have happened? Jesus would have, Holy Spirit would have instantly moved in his heart to start working to fix the problem, right? So there's this cooperative thing. That man showed, in, what do you call it, non-cooperation when he just sort of says he was sad or downcast, meaning upset, and instead of, saying, how, how, how can that ever happen? Like Nicodemus said, right? Nicodemus said, I, I don't even know how to accomplish what you're talking about. But instead, this man says, no, I'm going away. I'm, I'm not having that. That's the lack of cooperation. And instead of working on how to figure out the formula of all the little things you have to do, there's only one. Sister White says it this way. As long as you say, Lord, I, I'm willing to be made willing, now that means I'm not really willing, but I want to be. I can't even fix that, right? Okay, but another one. Where's something else Jesus said that sort of encouraged that pattern of cooperation? You had one? Well, I was probably one to speak to the last point. The, um, I don't know, it, with the rich young ruler, um, you know, I think in our Sabbath school class, we kind of kicked it around a little bit. It seems there was really more, the big problem was almost a lack of imagination. On whose part? On the rich one, really. It, okay, seemed, okay. it seems like when Christ bumped in, you, you hear the word amazing and, and, you know, new possibilities. And, you know, I think we also were kicking around the word gratitude, which also I think something plays in, in this. But I have a feeling that sometimes when, when we talk about healing, you know, we really kind of just want to get back to the status quo, or kind of where we were. Um, we don't seem to realize that God is opening some possibilities that we have never ever dreamed of. And so it's really probably, when it comes to healing, it's also maybe a smallness of thinking. Um, we just kind of want to get back to where we were, as opposed to opening a whole new chapter in our life. And, and, I, and sometimes I think God has to say no as maybe a possibility for us to you know, to look to something bigger. Good. 
Good, and that, that is the point of the heavens shut up, right? The heavens closed up. He's closing them up so that we can go, what, what is going on? What, what is it that I need to understand? What is it that I need to grasp? I mean, well, let me throw this one out. Here's another one where Jesus used that pattern of saying, you need to cooperate with me. <clears throat> the disciples said to Jesus, did you know that they didn't like that when you said that? And Jesus said, you know what he said? Leave them. They're blind guides. If a blind man follows a blind man, both will fall into a pit. What's he saying? What did he mean by that? If Say that again. If they were to follow them, they would be led in the wrong direction them who? as well. Blind. The blind. If, if they both went together the wrong direction, then... Okay, that makes sense. But who were the blind? Sinners. Which sinners? The leaders. Of what? <laughs> the Pharisees. Oh, my. We don't, we don't like those statements. You know, the pastor and I, we're, that puts us in a real tough position because we're standing up here talking, right? Jesus said, leave them. Uh-oh. Another place he said, um, everyone who came before me was a thief and a robber. You're supposed to enter in through the gate. I am the gate, Jesus said. Everyone who came before me is a thief and a robber. The thief and the robber climbs over the gate. Well, what is he talking about? Did anybody else ever represent God correctly? No. No. So in some fashion, they robbed. They robbed the people of their opportunity to see the truth. Here's Moses. Moses' amazing example of God. I mean, what other man do you see saying, Lord, I'm willing to be blotted out for eternity if that's what's needed? Okay? I mean, that, that's an amazing... I mean, Moses' whole story is amazing. But then you get down here to the end of the story, which started with... God's saying, Moses, you're going to be as God to the people. How'd you like it if he told you that tomorrow morning? You will be as God to the people. What did he mean, be as God? What he meant was, you will be my representative to represent me in all things, to speak correctly the words that I give you to speak, and don't add your own into it. Don't add your own ideas, your own theories, all this other stuff. Just tell them what I tell you to tell. And he's the guy that comes down off the mountain with his face glowing. And when he was up there in that mountain, what did he see when he saw God's glory? How did he describe it? The light was bright. Well, he didn't even say that because he was so bright. They said, no, cover him up. He's too bright for us to look at. Moses, that is. Merciful and gracious. And, and the Lord God, gracious, long-suffering, merciful, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. That's what he saw? His attributes? Yes, the truth about God's character. He got to see. This is the glory of God. Christ is the glory of God because Christ reveals the truth about God. Uh, that, that's what that is all about, the true glory of God. You can't give God glory. You ever hear this in church? Let's give God glory. You can't give God glory unless what? Unless you <coughs> are revealing, because meaning God is putting it in you and flowing through you, so that people can see what God is really like. That's the only way you can give him glory. Our songs don't give him glory. Our prayers don't give him glory. Our, our sermons don't give him glory. Unless the reality, the truth about God is coming through all those things, through our hearts. Otherwise, we're like the, the prophets of Baal, trying to give God glory, jumping around and cutting ourselves. Go ahead. There is one other aspect that this is kind of the, the balancing side that's always always intrigued me is in John 11, you're talking about Caiaphas, who was high priest for the year and said, you know nothing at all. You take into account that this is expedient that one man should die for the people and the whole nation perish. And he did not say this on his own initiative, because, but because he was high priest that year and prophesied that he was going to die for the nation. You know, I also think, though, is quite often is, is God puts people in the position of Moses, you know, puts fallible individuals in leadership. Caiaphas was probably not 
perfect. He had some flat spots that needed worked on. But yet, God used him to prophesy. And so I think that, you know, God will use people in their, you know, their positions, even though they may be blind guides, that doesn't mean they're without effect. And, and I hold on to that as a promise if given leadership position. And that is the reality that God can speak through donkeys, right? And I don't mean that just in a joking way. I mean that he literally did. He spoke through a donkey. So it's not impossible, we're back to King Saul again now, to take an evil man and knock him off his horse and prophesy through him for one sentence or three days, right? So, so we see that in that the power of God, the, the, the ability of God. <clears throat> but that was one of the blind guides that Jesus was talking about when he said to the disciples, leave them, don't follow them. Why? Even though he's prophesying correct words for a moment, he's also leading the rebellion to crucify Christ. That's Antichrist, the mixture of truth and error, kind of, so to speak. Yes? Well, you see, this, you see the same thing when he talked about the Pharisees. He says, do as they say, not as they do. That's right. And, and he tied into that, they sit in Moses' seat. So he wasn't just saying do everything they say. He was saying when they sit in Moses' seat, which is to repeat to you the law, the truth given through Moses, right, by God. When they tell you to do that, it's true. It doesn't matter who's saying it. Uh, an evil, wicked man can get up and read Psalms 51 all the way through, and it's still true. No matter who read it, no matter who said it, right? And so in that, we see the, the infallibility of the word different than having something to do with infallibility, infallibility of man. So we, we were kind of working all that because <laughs> we're still talking about healing. Uh, uh, and it's important because what Jesus wanted us to know, pastor said it, he wants to heal all. But what he's looking for is who would like to be healed. And, and again, I'm referring spiritually mostly. Uh, that other discussion about um, physical healing, yeah, it is, that's, a, that's a good question. Good question to dig into. There's some interesting stuff about that. And we won't worry about that at the moment. Because I want to get to wrath before we run out of time. <clears throat> and this piece, again, is just to now say, okay, with what we've worked on so far, when we put the next one up there, does it challenge it? Does it make it all fall apart? Does it change on us? Or do we have these at least going in the right direction, right? So what do you typically think of when you think of God's wrath? Someone reads a verse. Do you guys do that here where you have scripture and the only verse is there is something about God's wrath? And you sit down. We don't like those verses. Why not? Nobody wants to talk about that. And we'd much rather talk about healing, actually. <laughs> but wrath is a really, really uh, important thing because there are a lot of verses with that word in it. A lot of activities that in our minds are connected to God's wrath on purpose by the scripture, right? For instance, Sodom and Gomorrah, it does have something to do with God's wrath. The earth opening up and swallowing the children, it is connected to God's wrath. Don't be an Amalekite. Right. <laughs> So what do we do with this? If we, if we take the focus off all these stories that scare us as far as the results, leave them aside for a minute and go to the heart of God in his wrath. What is he like when he gets angry? Oh, what are his emotions? What are his facial expressions? How do, you, how do you envision him walking down there to Sodom and Gomorrah and right? What's on his face? What's in his heart? What's going on with his, because uh, it's true. See, our dilemma is we're usually writing into the story things that aren't actually said that are related to what my face looks like when I get angry, what my emotions are when I get angry, what I would do when you cross me and now I'm angry, right? <clears throat> and so we, we write into the story pieces that are not there. Like I've had people tell me that when Jesus flipped over the tables, he did have a whip, and he hit people. You read that part? You never read about the whip he was holding? Yeah, he oh, but you didn't read about the hitting people part. <laughs> Again, very carefully to divide between what it actually says and what we imagine. Some, somebody was imagining that when they read it, apparently. So they were telling me what it said, and so we went back and looked at it, and lo and behold, he's looking at it and going, wait, I guess it doesn't say that. Right? So, so putting this piece together about God's wrath is valuable. And I also want to say, 
because some of you have heard this before, so I'm trying to do some of the key elements without having to draw, I mean, go through the whole thing. We're not going to say that everything that ever happened in the Old Testament was not God actively working with discipline, actions of discipline with his children. There is a theory going out there about God's wrath that, oh, we finally just turned it into God never did, you know, it wasn't his angel that came to Egypt for the Passover and killed the firstborn, and it wasn't him that opened up the earth and sw No, and that's, some are doing that. Uh, that doesn't make sense to me. I'm willing to be shown that I'm wrong. But so far, it doesn't make sense to me that we start rewriting pieces of Scripture, right? It does say that God came down. It does say that the fire came out from the most holy place and devoured Nadab and Abihu, right? We don't want to rewrite that and say, well, suddenly Satan jumped in there and killed him or, or some other version that it isn't written. It actually says that. But when we read the rest of the story about Nadab and Abihu, have you noticed this? It's kind of interesting to me. It says, fire came out from the most holy place and devoured Nadab and Abihu, who were apparently in the holy place, right, on the other side of the veil. And, and it was about the strange fire, and that's a, a great topic to work on. We'll, we'll work on that maybe tonight. But, but after you get the strange fire part figured out, you get to this next verse. And it says, so his cousins, meaning it says the Levites, which were related to Nadab and Abihu, they came in and they carried them out how? Do you remember what it says? By their clothing. Well, how can you get, how can you get them carried out by their clothing when they just got fried? What? They drugged them out. By their clothing. It says they actually, it says they carried them out by their tunics. How can they have tunics on if they just got burned to death? Gruesome, smelly, horrible. Gruesome and, and, no and do they still have clothes on when they're... No. no. They use sponges, not carrying them out in their clothes. These guys still had their clothes on. Yeah. And so all of a sudden we're reading a piece of the story that, that sort of, you know, it kind of, wait a minute. Maybe my thinking wasn't quite clear because I can't explain how that works, right? So this is my point. Read carefully what it says. The, the bottom line of God's wrath, so we can get right to it, uh, how many of you ha do not remember this cliff idea with the child? Everybody saw that, right? Anybody not seen that? Lester never saw that? Okay, for, for, let me do it then just for those of you who haven't seen it. You can, you can burn from the center out, still have the carcass. Still have the clothes there? Might be scientifically possible. I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure how to explain that one. But, but let's get more to the heart of the matter. Here, let me just do this. Some of you have seen this, so, so that's okay. It's a good review. This is, this is a picture or an imagery in your mind, a parable, if you will, to help us sort of step back from what we have always thought and re-approach this topic of wrath. And it's like this. Imagine having a child, not like the child you had before or children you've had before. This is a different child. This child, their favorite thing to do is be with you. If you're mowing the lawn, they want to help dishes. They love doing that as long as you're doing that. <clears throat> they just want to be with you. They act like you. They talk like you. Uh, they, in every way, want to be like you. And as they get a little bit older, you go on walks, you know, further and further from home. And one day, with this very special child, you come across this cliff. They'd never seen that before. But they look over that cliff and they say, Mom, Dad, that looks fun. Can I jump? Totally innocent in the question. Mom, Dad, can I jump? What do you say? No. no? Not allowed. No. Okay, anybody else? <laughs> different, different answer? I mean, at five years old, you're, you're, you're not going to allow that, right? So you must take the child by the hand and take them home. Tomorrow, when it's time to go on a walk, where do they want to go? Yeah, right back to that same cliff. It's almost now they're addicted to this thing. Can't get it off their mind. You can walk in a different direction with them, but in their heart and mind, where are they going? Right back over there. Because they have this question, Mom, Dad, can I jump? And you say no. Here's the dilemma. If you force them not to jump until they're, say, 18, how's that going to work as far as relationship goes? Pretty soon resentment begins, blame begins, anger begins, and now they don't want anything to do with you. Isn't that how it works with our teenagers? I'm just kind of in that stage right now. 
My daughter's 15. <laughs> Pray for me. No, she's, 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 a, she's a beautiful daughter. She's, uh, she's learning good things. But, you know, it, it, she's a typical teenager. And uh, so we see this happen where there's this sort of this, you know, got to get back to that cliff sort of thing. I want to try it. I want to jump. I'm sure it's okay. It won't really hurt me too bad, will it? But you know. You know that to go to the bottom of this is what? Death. There's no way around that. That is the result. It is the natural consequences. It is not something you made up. It is not some rule you just wrote into existence because you don't like, you know, kids having too much fun. That's not what it is. It's the natural result. So your child is saying, Mom, I want to jump. Dad, I want to jump. So how can we educate the child? Because we can't force them forever to not jump. Neither can we just let them jump in ignorance. So how are we going to educate them? Find a short, a short cliff, maybe, four feet high, let them jump, maybe sprain their ankle, because if they've never felt pain before, that would be helpful. Dead, not helpful. Sprained ankle might be helpful, right? Some consequences. What else could you try? Chuck a watermelon off. This yeah. Thing. Okay. Throw something else. Throw something off. Let them watch what is the results of gravity and impact and all those other fancy scientific terms, right? We'll let them see what occurs. Watermelon, um, you know, maybe a, a pet cat or dog. We did an egg. Egg might, we might try that before we do the sheep. Because we did that for 4,000 years. That was the point. These are things that we're, we, don't want, we don't want them jumping in the stove, but they might have to just feel the heat a little bit. We don't want third degree burns, right? See, we're always trying to prevent with our children the, the full results, but let them just feel a little bit of it. That's how we learn. And God knew that. And so God gave us lambs for 4,000 years so we could see two things. What is the results of separation from God? Death. And the second thing we could see his love and willingness to go through that to show us what it was and to rescue us from it. Right? That, that's, a love. that's what the whole point of the sheep and lambs are for, goats and all that. So we could try that. <clears throat> but uh, after you've tried a myriad of things, cantaloupes, watermelons, sheep, goats, uh, eventually you're, you're going to run out of options except one left. Right? What if you jump? What if you go down to the bottom? What if you are separated from the source of life and you go through that? You're human. See, they, they, they can't say to you, oh, Dad, I'm not a watermelon. I've got legs. I've been you know, lifting weights. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, because you're bigger than they are. You're more powerful than they are. You have eyes and ears and feet and hands just like, just like they do. You look just like them. And they can watch you go through it as Jesus goes through that separation, starting in the garden, right? Didn't start on the cross. Started on the, in the garden. He was being separated from his father. That's beautiful that he did that because he needed, to see, he needed us to see it separate from all the beatings we were going to put on him. So we wouldn't be confused thinking he died from beatings and, 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 and thorns and all that. What he died from was separation from his father and he's sweating drops of blood. Remember he told his disciples, watch. Watch. And, and this is amazing. When you have fun sort of just doing a separate study on this, he tells his disciples to watch and as we look at what were they supposed to watch? What would they see if they didn't fall asleep? They would see their Lord and Master starting to go through separation from his father. Now did any of them see it? It's amazing we even have it written in the Bible because none of them saw it. The Holy Spirit, of course, gave it to them to write because none of them saw it. They all fell asleep. Jesus woke them up a couple times. But they were supposed to start watching this most amazing revelation that heaven got, but, but we were sleeping, right? This, this, what is the answer to the question, what is the results of sin? Jesus there was the first one ever in history and ever so far since then to go through that. Nobody else has gone through that. Not Satan, not, not Adam and Eve, not any other human that has lived and died into sleep death, right? Jesus said they're just sleeping. 
They, ha they haven't gone through death yet. Death is what Jesus went through in this separation. So, so we got to watch that. Now, if on the third day, which he did, if you come back to life and you say to your child who watched all that, are you sure I can't talk you out of that? Are you sure I can't talk you into staying with me? Jesus said, abide in me and I will abide in you. That's the, the picture of the tree branch intertwined with the trunk of the tree, so to speak. Sap flowing through the vine into the branch or in the, tr the trunk into the tree branch, right? Providing life. And he does say, hang on to me with everything you got. That's what he said to Jacob. Remember Jacob? Who brought up that story? Yeah, fighting him off, and then all of a sudden it switches, and Jacob starts hanging on to the one that he thought was his enemy for all he's got. But did he have any real strength to hang on? No. To God? I mean, touches his hip, wham, right? But nonetheless, God said, now hang on to me, Jacob, with everything you got. That's the abide in me. And, and then the life flowing from God into us that totally changes transforms and produces fruit. That's the whole picture of that. But back to our child. After you've, you've shown all that and revealed all that, and now your child says to you, let's say he's 30 years old now, okay, mom, dad, but I, I don't want to be with you. I do not want you. I want to jump. How would you feel? Edie? Devastated. Devastated. How would you feel? Roberto, would you, would you love the child? Yes. Would you forgive the child for being so ridiculously stubborn? No. <laughs> no, he said. <laughs> but you see, we know because we did that already, right? Forgive them. God does, though. The question now becomes, but can you save the child? Not, not after you've done all this. Not after everything that heaven can be done has been done and the child still says, I don't want you, let me go. This is Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, if you want to write the verses down, you can study it later. The whole chapter would be good. Romans chapter 1, in verse 16, Paul's going to talk about the gospel. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm very excited about it because it is the power of God to rescue sinners. And then verse 17, he makes a comment there about it's about the revelation of God. This power, this, this power of God to save sinners is all about the revelation or God's character being revealed. And then in verse 18, because see verse 17 did love, forgiveness, and healing. And now in verse 18, wrath. And, and we usually read that and we don't want to read the 18. We just like 16 and 17. But verse 18 says, now the wrath of God is revealed, and instantly our minds switch from good news to what? Bad news. We switch to, oh my, this, this is about God beating up all the wicked people. This is what he's going to do to those prostitutes and tax collectors and, and uh, you know, homosexuals and the whole list you know, on, on, right there in Romans. Our mind reads that, and what we see is, oh yeah, God, these, this is the group that God is going to whip up on. But it doesn't say that in there. What it says is this is the revelation of God, verse 18. Verse 24, for this reason, God did what? Anybody looking at it? Gave them over. Gave who over? The, the, the wicked sinners that just got described in the verse that's coming next. He gave them over. Verse 26, therefore God let them go or gave them up. Verse 28, since they did not think it useful to retain God in their knowledge, right? They exchanged the truth for a lie. Therefore, God gave them over. Three times. Why does an author do that? Yeah, he's trying to help us figure out, oh, this is important. This is God's wrath revealed. Paul is saying, this is what I learned about God's wrath. I used to think it was, you know, he'd get frustrated and you're blaspheming, so we have to lock you up in prison and take you out and stone you. That's how he viewed God's wrath. And so here's Paul, Saul at the time, he's riding on his horse and he gets knocked off by this bright light, he can't even see, he's on the ground, and lo and behold, who was it? Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory showed up and knocked him off his horse. Can you imagine if you had the theology that said, uh, if you're a sinner in any way, and you come into the presence of a Shekinah glory, you're going to be instantly destroyed. You guys don't have that theology, right? 
Can you imagine if you had that theology in your mind and you get knocked off your horse because you, you, you're running into Shekinah glory and he tells you, why are you warring against me? He's warring against Shekinah glory. That's what, what he's bringing up there. And, and Saul now, who's very confused, he's got to go to this room where he's going to wait for someone to come and, and fix. Oh, all that's wrong with him is his eyes? That's, that's not, not too bad, considering he just ran into Shekinah glory. But you understand that God could read the heart. He knew, he knew that Saul was really looking for Shekinah glory, but he was confused and deceived, and he didn't understand. And so he was showing up in all of his glory to say, Saul, where did you get that idea from? So that Saul could go back. It says he went to the deserts of Arabia. Ellen White talks about how he unlearned everything he had learned and had to restudy the whole Old Testament because he couldn't figure out how can this be that I'm still alive when I was at war with God and I bumped into God and I'm not dead. He expected it should be instant death. He had to figure that out. And so Sister White talks about how Saul suddenly saw in the Old Testament, this is amazing to me, in, no, no New Testament to read yet. In the Old Testament, now he started to see the truth about God's character, especially in regards to his wrath. You know where he found it? Hosea. Story of Hosea, right? You know the story. And you see this activity of Hosea trying to bring her back, bring her back, and his love seems to keep coming. His, his forgiveness seems to keep going. And I'm thinking, man, that guy, he went after... You know, we don't... We, that's not natural to us. She does that to me one time, we think, that's it, never again. <laughs> that's our natural response, right? But not Hosea. And God then speaks to Hosea, or to Hosea, after Hosea is in broken tears because she's left again and again and again and she will not stay home and God says to him yeah she's not going to stay home you have to let her go but but he says it to Hosea in this way he suddenly switches from Hosea's wife to God's wife when he says right how can I give you up how can I let you go how can I see you devoted to destruction this is the heart of Jesus as he came in on the donkey and he looked over Jerusalem and he wept. I promised to give you a bunch of references for all that, didn't I? Here's one. Um, as long as this cooperates. Desire of Ages, actually, I'll tell you before I even get there. Desire of Ages. See, Wrath of God. Desire of Ages, the chapter called The King Cometh. Right? This is the one Jesus riding in on the donkey. You really need to sort of read that one and write on through to the woes of the Pharisees chapter and watch carefully for this theme. I'm just going to read some of this, if that's okay. Um, this is Jesus. He's coming in the donkey, right? So all the people are shouting Hosanna, waving palm branches. The whole activity is going on. They're celebrating and excited. But it says, Jesus gazes upon the scene and the vast multitude hushes their shouts, spellbound by the sudden vision of beauty. In other words, they see the temple and they all go, oh, isn't that amazing? Okay, because they saw the temple. All eyes turn to the Savior, expecting in his countenance the same admiration they have for the temple they built. I added that part, the they built. <laughs> in other words, they were expecting him to be in great admiration of what they had built for God. And yet... There was no Shekinah glory in there. There was no Ark of the Covenant in there. Those high priests went in every year doing the thing, and there's nothing in there. All eyes turned upon the Savior, expecting to see in his countenance the same admiration that they felt. But instead of this, they behold a cloud of sorrow. They are surprised and disappointed to see his eyes filled with tears. And his body rocks to and fro like a tree before the tempest while a wail of anguish bursts from his quivering lips as if from the depths of a broken heart. What a sight was this for angels to behold their beloved commander in the agony of tears. What a sight this was for the glad throng with shouts of triumph and waving of palm branches as they were escorting him to the glorious city where they fondly hoped he was about to reign. Israel's king was in tears. Not silent tears of gladness, but tears of, and groans of insuppressible agony. The multitude were struck with a sudden gloom and their acclamations were silenced. Now get this, many of them now wept in sympathy 
with a grief they could not comprehend. They don't even know why they're crying. They don't understand what's going on. They, this is such a, an amazing emotion coming out of Christ, spirit coming out of Christ, that they're overwhelmed by it, but they don't understand it. Going down a little bit, the thought of his own agony did not intimidate him, not that self-sacrificing soul. It was the sight of Jerusalem that pierced the heart of Jesus, Jerusalem that had rejected the Son of God and scorned his love, that refused to be convinced by his mighty miracles and was about to take his life. He saw what she was in her guilt of rejecting her Redeemer and what she might have been had she accepted him alone who could heal her wound. He had come to save her. How could he give her up? Right? How could he give her up? How could he let her go? How could he see her devoted to destruction? Now, when you, you get there, you're grabbing the whole emotion, the heart of Christ, wanting to save, and yet and here he is, right? It's just like when we're thinking about it here, how would we feel about it if it was our child? Now, now, in case we think the woes of the Pharisees is, well, okay, but that's where Jesus finally got, you know, rough and whipped up on them. Listen to this. This is at the end of the woes of the Pharisees. It says, divine pity, sorry, this is in Desire of Ages, next chapter, woes of the Pharisees. Divine pity marked the countenance of the Son of God as he cast one lingering look upon the temple and upon his hearers. And in a voice choked by deep anguish of heart and bitter tears, he exclaimed, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stone them which are sent unto thee, how often I would have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you would not come. Now listen to this. When you grab the emotion right there that was just described, it says this. This what Jesus is feeling, this is the separation struggle. What, what does that mean? This is the separation struggle. What's that mean? Who's struggling? Jesus is God is struggling with what? Separation. Letting go, right? This is the separation struggle. In the lamentation of Christ, the very heart of God is pouring itself forth. The heart of who? God. It is the mysterious farewell of the long-suffering love of the deity. What's he going through? Going through having to let go. How did we get this idea that he loses his temper and he gets mad and starts beating people up? When he came to Sodom and Gomorrah, is it the same God? The one that's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow? The one that changes not? With him there's no shadow of turning? Same God. But we read those stories that we don't see all of this facial expression and we write our face into the story. We've got to stop doing that. We've got to read Jesus' face. We've got to read Jesus' love. Then read the story like this. Sodom and Gomorrah, Christ the Messiah came down and walked down to the city and made an investigation as to who would be willing to come out of her, my people. That was Christ doing that. Remember, he stopped off, talked to Abraham about it. And who do you think was inspiring Abraham to get brave enough just to ask for a few, more, a few less and a few less? <laughs> that was the heart of God being spoken through Abraham. I wish Abraham would have been just a little braver. But nonetheless, Jesus goes down to Sodom and Gomorrah. This was not a, yay, yippee, let's wipe them out. I remember I was standing on a street, maybe it was a corner, anyway, on a block, in a place called uh, Bourbon Street. You ever heard of that? Yeah. I, I don't even know how I got there, <laughs> except that I was uh, about 19 and with uh, a group of youth directors. Not from this conference, don't worry. <laughs> and we were down there. I, I, I don't even really remember why, uh, but I, I do remember this. As I was going by this window, this very not clothed young gal I noticed standing in the window. Not, not in, the, in, the, in the inside room there, in the window. I don't remember anything about her except her eyes. Because her eyes were hurting and empty. And, and right there in a flash, sort of in my brain, I don't even know where you know, uh, this idea came, except maybe from God, I began to imagine what her life must be like. She probably does this till 2 or 3 in the morning. Does that help her feel good about herself? 
No, she's probably, you can see she's high on something. And so she's going to go home and she's going to sleep and she's going to wake up in the morning. And she's going to have all that rush of, 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 of depression and fear and guilt and all of that just crushing on her. So we've got to start with something to help wash it away. I don't know what, something that might be in the fridge. And then something maybe in a syringe or something. But we've got we to gotta do all that because by you know, 6 o'clock in the evening, we've got to get back in that window and do it again. If that was even slightly how bad it was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah, do you think it was unkind for God to put them into their grave? Out of mercy is what happened. Now, I know we could get all complicated and start figuring out, well, wait a minute, every person, everyone, every, I don't know. I do know this, God, God does not do things because he's frustrated like us. He does not do things because he's out of patience like we do. He comes to Sodom and Gomorrah, Jesus Christ comes to Sodom and Gomorrah and now puts them out of their misery. Now the amazing part is he comes later and he's talking to the Pharisees and now, now they're not, they, these guys are not without evidence, right? Sodom and Gomorrah, they didn't have Jesus in the flesh. The Pharisees did and he says to the Pharisees, hey, it's going to be better in the judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you. And in another place, he says, if the people in Sodom and Gomorrah had seen the miracles you have seen, they would have long since repented. I'm thinking, man, that just sort of messes up my whole theology. Because I thought, you know, for sure, once you're that bad, there's no hope. And I'm not going to project what's going to happen, but I do know this. If God knows that somewhere in the middle of all that mess, there was people who would have wanted him had they been able to come to know him face to face like Peter, James, and John, God knows how to take care of them and get them to the right place, see? Because God's wrath, God's wrath is about letting go of those who absolutely refuse him. Let me give you a couple more references because I'm doing too much talking here. Um, here's one. This one. Well, let me get the right one. I read you that one this morning. Limit of grace. Did I read you limit of grace? Yeah. Remember that one? Limit of grace. There is a limit to this grace. Mercy may plead for years and be slighted and rejected. That's from Desire of Ages again, page 587. Uh, the heart becomes so hardened that it ceases to respond to the Spirit of God. Then the sweet winning voice entreats the sinner no longer. Again, this is not about God running out of patience. It's about if our heart gets to a condition that will never accept him, it, it suddenly becomes not loving for him to keep wooing, drawing, and pushing. But here's another one. Great Controversy. Great Controversy, page 605. <clears throat> and this is a principle that we have to just allow to apply even if we can't figure out all the details of every story. It says this, Not one, that's no one, is made to suffer the wrath of God, whatever it is, until the truth has been brought home to his mind and conscience and has then been rejected. See, that, that's, why, that's where I'm getting this idea of how the principle works. Um, see if I got any more here that are really good. That, that, so Go ahead. That goes along with Romans chapter 2. Good. Um, look at verse, we go. That concept of waiting goes along with Romans chapter 2. I think it's, it's word, verse... Um, Verse 5, it says, But after, the, after thy hardness and impotent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath. So it doesn't say the experienced wrath, it's building up. Mm -hmm. and, and you keep going, and it says, And the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient countenance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Good. So there's a building up that takes place. Well, and let's connect to that one part in that verse where it talks about according to their deeds. You've got to keep this formula straight. The deeds or the actions, the, the, the sins or the righteousness in the life is the result of what? The either surrendering or not surrendering the heart. In other words, he's not going to stack up a whole list of how many bad things you did. If he did that, we're all in trouble. But what he is going to do is say, look, you, you see the way the heart is responding in Judas versus the way the heart is responding to Peter, both of which sinned, but one sinned and then 
ran to the Lord, the other one rejected the Lord. There's the heart issue of this building up of wrath. Here's another principal one. This is from Great Controversy again, but now from page 36. So it's uh, right in the Destruction of Jerusalem chapter, chapter 1. But when men pass the limits of divine forbearance, what's forbearance? It's not just patience. It's, it is patience. Huh? Okay, uh, and, and usually the reason I ask is because if we again turn it into God ran out of forbearance, well, then he's changing again. But watch this. But when men pass the limits of divine forbearance and the restraint is removed, what restraint? What's the restraint? The hand of God, the, hand of God, the spirit of God. In other words, right now, we know this by theory, right? That the, the, the okay environment that we have is held in check by the Spirit of God. If he removed himself completely from every heart in this community who at the moment were rejecting him for whatever reason, oh, we'd have... Yeah, they make zombie movies about that kind of stuff. I don't watch those, but, but I've heard of them, right? And, and that's what occurs. That's what took place in Jerusalem, but it's held in check. So when that restraint is moved, God does not stand towards the sinner as the executioner. Now that's right in Great Controversy, chapter 1. And I know a lot of us, we read the last eight chapters of Great Controversy and we're just sure that God is going to wipe them out. But it says here, God does not stand in chapter 1 as the executioner towards the sinner of the sentence against transgression, but he leaves the rejecters of his mercy to themselves to reap that which they have sown. And Ellen White uses actually that whole chapter on wrath. Instead of just taking it by my theory, read that chapter. And underline in Great Conversation Chapter 1 everything that helps you think about how this wrath works. It's all over in that chapter. And it kind of starts at the beginning of the chapter with this idea that God's angel, it talks about his angel of destruction, is standing over the city, and you're going, whoops, see, here it comes. And then she works it all the way through the chapter. I'm reading you from further down in the chapter where she suddenly switches it for us, and we realize, oh, wait a minute. This was not about God wanting to wipe out the people. This is about them rejecting him so long that he has to step back now and give them over to the consequence in their choice. That's the one I was talking about earlier today about the destruction of Jerusalem. Read that chapter. Look for it. Underline it. Figure out what is this retributive justice, you know. You hear that term? Retributive justice. All connected to this wrath idea. And I'm going to just sort of, everybody take a deep breath. Questions? Forbearance, yes. Yeah, where'd it go? I think they, oh, do I have it? I guess I've got it. <laughs> I was thinking you had it. <laughs> if, any of you, if any of you have that uh, Merriam-Webster app on your cell phone, that's where it's at. The quality of someone who is patient and able to deal with a difficult person or situation without becoming angry. But this next one is even, well, I think the two of them together. A refraining from the enforcement of something as a right, debt, or obligation that is due. Does that, does that help? <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Again, we've got to see that statement about passing the limits of divine forbearance. That limit is not the limit of God running out of it. It's the limit of the heart having any ability to receive it. And that's where we keep getting it sort of upside down, and then we blame it on God, like he ran out of patience or something. Okay, but uh, other thought, question? We run out of life. We run out of life? Life, yeah. I mean, so the chances are, our chances are over when you die. I mean, yeah, probation. Let's, let's do that one real quick. <laughs> probation is going to close, right? And, and for a long time, again, the theology that I learned... Uh, sort of our standard thing was this probation is going to close and after that no more chance for you. And so I, when I was 13, I was baptized when I was 12. And when I was 13, I remember praying, uh, Lord, please help me to be on the right side today in case today's the day that you, you show up. Because if you show up today and I'm on the wrong side, what's going to happen? <laughs> this is how I viewed probation. 
My grandfather on my mother's side was an Adventist, a long time ago. <laughs> but uh, he, he was a, what you'd call an angry person. And uh, he had uh, five kids. And uh, uh, my mom uses the word beatings, you know. Uh, anyway, it was very lots of spankings, I guess. Um, but one day, Grandpa come home, and he had his briefcase or whatever, his, maybe his lunchbox, probably more like it, because he didn't work in an office. Lunchbox. And, uh, and usually he came home 30 minutes before sundown. And he expected all the children to be lined up on the couch, all the work done, showers had, clean behind the ears, ready for worship 30 minutes before. But this particular day... He showed up late. It was only 15 minutes before sundown. So he already was running behind. And then when he got into the house, the vacuum and whatever they had back in those days, stuff was still going. Maybe it was a mop. And so he saw this. It's, it's, we're supposed to be 30 minutes before. Now we're 15 minutes before. We're not guarding the edges of the Sabbath. We're breaking the edges of the Sabbath. So his lunchbox goes flying, smash, you know, on the, in the kitchen floor. And he starts hollering. That's the word my mom uses. Remember, I wasn't there. <laughs> he starts hollering, and he says, that's it. We've broken the Sabbath. We're going to break it all day tomorrow. You're cutting wood all day. He made them cut wood during the Sabbath hours to make his point. So my mom, who was, you know, lower in the ladder of children, I forget if she's third or fourth, somewhere there. Her memory of that was... <clears throat> She was scared to death, because what if God showed up that day? So I guess maybe I came by that a little bit rightly. Mine wasn't quite so fierce. My mom didn't act like that. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, we have this sort of idea about probation. Probation is not when God arbitrarily announces your time's up. I know it says Michael stands up in heaven and he says, it's finished. But when he says that, is he saying it's finished because God ran out of patience? Or because God said, look, I'm tired of just dealing with this? Or is it because the work of God on the earth, the truth about God has been revealed, and everybody living in one generation has fully cited either for or against? That's a totally different version of probation. One is about the love of God, working to rescue and save, not willing that any should perish, right? But it will come to a point where the, the revelation is given so strong and so across the whole earth of this good news about God that everybody will be either fully sighted or fully against who's alive. That doesn't take away that you and I may die before that time. So our probation, this word probation, which isn't even in the Bible. It's kind of cute the other day. My, my daughter says, yeah, where's the verse on that one? I told her, well, get your computer and look. <laughs> Dad, it's not in here. Yeah, it's true. So we went to the parable, my daughter and I, went to the parable about the, the wedding feast, right? And the wedding feast, where all the guests were invited, but a whole bunch didn't want to come, and so they were uh, killed and slain. And then they went out to the highways and the byways, and they invited everybody in, both good and bad, it says. Really? Both good and bad. That's amazing. And apparently the king provided a robe for everybody. Now that robe, let me just say real quick, that robe is not something that you put on on the outside to cover up your sinfulness. I, I know we, we do the prodigal son story and we sort of you know, grab that little piece where he's all smelling like a pig and, and, and then the father throws the robe and we think that the idea is to just cover up the smell. How are you going to cover up that smell? Not, a robe's not going to do it. The robe talked about in this parable, Ellen White says this about it, it has not one stitch of human making. Well, that's interesting. You mean it's completely, as she says, woven in the loom of heaven. That means God made every piece of it. Then she says this robe is not something you put on the outside, but something that comes from the, remember he said, you know, you whitewash the cup, or not whitewash, but you wash the cup and dish on the outside. And then he said, you fools. Oh, was he talking to me? <laughs> you fools. Don't you know if you wash the inside, the whole cup will be clean? He was referring to this robe. It isn't God trying to cover us up as if somehow he needs to see us different than we are. This isn't Jesus hiding from the Father what we really are. I mean, I, I learned those theories when I was in academy. That we just have him sort of cover us up and then God looks and he doesn't see you, he sees Jesus. 
And we say, whoo, good thing, because I, I don't want him looking at me. That is not how it works. What this is, is Christ weaving into your hearts his righteousness until what God sees in your heart is the righteousness of Christ. It's the transformation of the heart. That's the rope. But nonetheless, this guy, you remember in the parable, he shows up without the rope. So he thinks he's coming, you know, based on his own works or robe, whatever he made in his loom. That's the Pharisees in the story. And that was intended for the Pharisees to hear when Jesus told that. And so in this story now, we have what's called the investigative judgment. Ready for that? <laughs> the investigative judgment, the king comes into the, to the feast there, and what does the king do? He starts looking around, welcoming guests, right? And looking to see what kind of robe we got on, right? That's what the king is doing. And as he goes around, he comes across this guy who was provided a robe, and yet he showed up with a different robe. Citizen's garment, Ellen White calls it in one place, instead of the royal robe. And so he puts on, he's got on his own robe, and, and you notice what, what the king says. Remember, he says, friend. Why does he call him friend? Yeah, just like Judas, that's true. He called Judas friend, didn't he? Why have you come, friend? Do what you have to do. Endearing. It is endearing. Jesus didn't mean to say that sarcastically to Judas like I would, <laughs> right? The fact that he has come is yet another opportunity. Are you sure you're going to keep going down this path? Are you sure you're not going to fall on your knees right now and say, you know what, I was wrong? That's how Jesus was towards Judas. The king says to him, friend, because he came. And because God is wanting to be a friend to him, but he sees that the robe is the wrong robe. And he says, how did you come in? Not having on the robe or not having your heart transformed. And what does the man say? Trick question. <laughs> See if anybody's... Do you remember what the man said? There was nothing to say. Oh, that's amazing because self-righteousness always self-justifies. It's always got a reason, always got an excuse. It's ready to, you know, snap out with some reason why I did what I did, but not this guy. Why not? He knew. This had nothing to do with him coming in ignorance. This had nothing to do with him coming and saying, oh, oh I, I forgot, the dog ate the, the garment. You know? Nothing to do with any of that. He knew full well Christ had provided to him the opportunity to have his heart transformed, and he said, no, I'd prefer to come in with my own. My name is Judas, right? And Jesus called him friend. And he asked him the question. And because the man has absolutely nothing to say, are you sure, Judas? Isn't there something you could say? I mean, what should he say? Lord, help me. Lord, help me, because except by thy grace, I, I, I have nothing. If he'd have said that, there would have been a different story. But the man said nothing. And so Jesus, in the story, says he was cast out into outer darkness. That is the same as the line that says, given over to a deception or given over to a lie, right? Strong delusion, another verse in the Old Testament, where there's a weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the investigative judgment. It's simply the king looking to see today. Anybody willing to receive the robe, to receive the heart of Christ in you? That's what he's looking for. So I use that to, again, remember I was helping my daughter with this idea of probation. So we could just say probation is the time, simply the time, with which you have to think and to look and behold Christ and then decide. That's it. Don't have to make a big scary thing about it except to say this. Why would we wait one day longer? Why would we resist one more minute? Today, while it is called today, do not be found fallen short of entering into this rest of trusting and depending on God to write his law in your heart. Wrath. Wrath is the emotion that God goes through in his weeping and his tears when he has to give them up and let them go. And at the very end, when he raises up the wicked and they all bow the knee and confess with the tongue that he's Lord, true, and just, and he has to give them over to their choice, which is what again? Death, right? How will he feel? So much so that he will not, at that moment, let them go. He's going to wait for one more thing. They're, they're, they're down there. They've bowed the knee. They're getting up now. They're grabbing implements of war. 
to charge the city, showing that they still will kill God if they get the chance, even though they've confessed that he's Lord, true, and just. And while that's happening, God's waiting for one more thing. What is it? For the whole universe to turn to God and say, God, there's nothing more that you can do. You have done everything that can be done for them. They're not down there because you won't let them in. They're down there because they will kill you if they get the chance. They don't want you. They hate you. They'll run for the rocks and cry out, hide us from the face of him who comes. You have to, in love, let them go. Now God will do it. I'm sort of writing into the story based on what I see in Jesus when I look backwards. I'm not going to ask that you quote me when we get to that story. <laughs> but I will tell you this. It'll be amazing to watch. It's going to be the most amazing part of this whole story. It doesn't disinclude the cross. It's actually the cross now brought to its full, full uh, accomplishment, if you will, that those who wanted God are transformed in their hearts. And those who reject, we see that God did everything he could. And it wasn't because of him that they're excluded. That, that's going to be an amazing moment. And I don't want you to take that picture and then assume that we're just wiping out all the stories in the Old Testament. God did bring fire out to Nadab and Abihu. That's called training and discipline. They're not dead yet. They're only sleeping. These are shadow deaths. These are shadows and examples of what it means, what it's going to happen at the very end story. And that's why it's interesting that God keeps throwing in these monkey wrenches to our thinking where we find out, oh my goodness, they still had garments. Maybe that didn't happen exactly as I imagine it. Are you saying they have another chance? Because I don't think they have another chance. Okay, that's a good question. Her question was, am I saying that the wicked at the end have another chance? Here's what, what I want to say clearly about that. The gates to the city are still open. God's hand is still not short. Right? He still is willing to save. Or has he changed? problem is they won't change their, their, choice has been made. their choice was made clear back when michael stood up and said the righteous will be righteous still meaning even the devil can't talk them out of it the unjust or the unrighteous will be unrighteous still because even god can't talk them out of it that that's how completely sighted if you will they are what we're watching at the third coming is not actually anybody changing sides, but it's confirming that God has made no mistakes. They're not down there because God mis mistakenly put somebody in the wrong place. So I'm not expecting to see any changes. I just want to be clear about God hasn't changed even at that moment. And, and he still desires to save. He still wants no one to die. And he will weep and then he'll wipe the tears from our eyes because we might have some friends or relatives or somebody who we cannot believe they wouldn't change or turn or repent, and yet we watched it. We watched it now, and now we're sure. God, you've done everything you can. So he'll wipe those tears away, and then he will say this, mourn for them no more. And when I first read that, I thought, well, that's not a very sensitive thing. Now, this isn't for us to actually grasp and experience now. Uh, meaning, right now, we should be in tears and weeping and mourning. You know the whole thing in uh, Ezekiel uh, 9, right? Those who sigh and cry for the abominations done in the land and in the church and, and so on. Um, that's the mode we need to be in. But there will come a time when God will say, why will you keep crying for them? Didn't you see that they, they didn't want it? See, all of a sudden now, this, this weeping and crying, now it doesn't fit anymore. Because now we have to say God gave them what was right what was true and what they wanted. And so he gave them in mercy and, and in peace and in justice, not just in some sort of arbitrary decision. You, you can do the story. Okay. It's, it's David with the son of Bathsheba, when he mourns. Yes. He yes. Perfect fit of an example there. Because the problem there with that whole thing, right, is he's, he's David. He's, he's now gone past willing to give his life to save, and now he's doing the sort of poor me thing because I don't want to live without this guy, which is what was happening in the heart of Adam the moment he realized his wife was in trouble. Ellen White says that he reasoned to himself. He should have reasoned that, well, God gave her to me. He could give me either a different one or he could fix this one or something. But instead, he reasoned in his mind, right, that, wait a minute, I can't live without her. That's what David was suddenly doing. And that's the context of what 
after the third coming, for tears to just go on and on and on and on, it would be falling in back into that, Lord, I just don't, I can't, don't think I can be here without my child or my mom or somebody. And again, I, I'm not sure that I'm ready to emotionally grasp that completely yet. I think that'll be why he's going to wipe the tears from the eyes and help us come to that point. Right now, what he wants us to be doing is pouring everything we have into helping and rescuing and wooing and drawing. Is that, is that, is that what you're thinking, Pastor? No, I, I was actually referring to Bathsheba's baby. Right. right. Is that what you were... Because I, I thought you sound like... Not Solomon, the first baby. Not Absalom, I'm talking about right. the baby that was lost. Right. And that, that's where I was meaning. Yeah. David, he's weeping he, over he, that, like, oh, no. The baby's actually gone. Yep. And then he gets up and he cleans his clothes. That's right, I forgot that detail. And, and, and who was it that said to him, what, what are you doing? Wasn't there somebody that said There's to him, why have... There's servants there that yeah. were wondering, what are, you, what are you doing? Yeah, what was that? He's like weeping, weeping, because weeping. He's weeping before the child dies, but then he doesn't weep after the death. That's, a, that's also a great fit. It is. It's the timing. It's, you weep for what makes a difference, not for what does. At a certain point, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't fit anymore. That's a great, a great, I'm going to have to write that one down and use that more often. Well, Thank you. That's what I was going to bring up, too, that when you're a child, that story meant a lot to me, that, uh, <clears throat> that when the servants were trying to, you know, help him get over it, and, and he couldn't as long as there was a chance. But once the child was dead, he immediately got up, washed, ate, it was all over. And that's what really is going on here because, you know, the process that we're going to have to go through, if my mom didn't make it, I, that would be a hard time. So I understand God would have to show me no matter what I could have done, she would have never accepted it. And then he's going to wipe away the tears in all of our eyes and something's going to happen like David where we're going to just know, hey, no matter what, and it'll be painful, and there are going to be tears that he'll wipe out of our eyes. But we're not going to be, throughout eternity, anything but joyous. And that's, that's a big process. I mean, it's easy to say these things now once we go through it. Yeah. And it's going to take a thousand years. <laughs> that's what I mean, is that actually this is why God walks us through not just theories, but actual experience. So it goes past just, you know, an idea in our brain. Carrying that forward, when... Paul gives us counsels. He says, don't grieve as others grieve, but grieve with hope. That's how we're supposed to grieve. Good. It's interesting, if you think of the last day, if, if, you're, if a person is, God, if, if at the point they have completely rejected God and there is no more hope, there's no reason to grieve. That's right. Grief is removed from it because you can see the condition that, because our, our grief is to, our, our, our hope is, is attached to the concept of our grief, that there's a hope I can see them again. Right. That's good. And, and, and that, that is really, excuse me, Sherry, that is really what we should see in that verse about, oh, back again? <laughs> really what we should see in that verse about wiping away the tears. That, that's, you know, in that one sentence, it's encapsulated in that whole thing. I just wanted to add a few things, and that is that, uh, you know, it's important that all of us here are Bereans. And Paul said to Thessalonians, they were good people, but more noble were the Bereans because the Bereans believed what I said, but then they studied to see if it was so. And, and if all we're doing is believing anything that comes out of Bobby's mouth, then I, he'd be the first one to tell you that's not what's going on here. And I bring that up because, uh, you know, when you talked about weaving of the heart with the robe of righteousness, it actually, my understanding is it says that, just like the song, create in me a clean heart or a new heart, O God. So it's better than even a weaving process. It's creative. It's God, here's a field of dry bones. God gives uh, Ezekiel these words to speak. They're God's words. They're God's living word. He speaks, they rattle, they come to life. There's no breath in them. Then Jesus gives him the breath to prophesy, and now they're living beings. There's this vast army, and it's a large study. If you'll if you'll study the word in Scripture, created, creating, and and especially if you'll add the chapter in Lessons on Faith by A. T. Jones called Creation or Evolution, that's a big part of what we're talking about here tonight. 
This is creative power, what God speaks into us. It's not evolution. It's not a weaving. It's not a growing. It's not a process. The weaving, growing, and process is the relationship growing with us in Christ as we understand and appreciate more and more his character. Which is true. That's why God says it in so many different ways. The created me a clean heart, which is right out of our song and out of Psalms, is the idea that he has power to breathe it, to speak it, and it's so. The weaving wording is that he's not impersonal. It's not like he just stands back here and goes, okay, done with you, next. <laughs> he's intimate with it. The weaving doesn't mean that it's like, you know, a long, drawn-out, forever thing. No, there's going to be change. That is from the power of creation spoken, but it's intimate. It's speaking that every thread into existence, into your heart as it works, putting those two together. We're going to quit, right, because it's five. You need to eat, so we're going to let you go. Um, he's right, though. Do not take any of this just because I said it. I delight in sort of studying this and then sharing it, but you really got to dig and see that it's there for yourself. <laughs> so wrath. Simply put, wrath is God letting go. And when we see variations of his wrath or temporary disciplines and training, don't just wipe it out as if God's not involved. He was intimately involved. He's the one that opens the earth. He's the one that does the flood. He's the one that has all things by his command and by his hand. And when I say let go in the end, if he doesn't, if he doesn't let go, will they die? Can, can they die if he's still holding them up? No. So the action there is still in the hand of God to let go. But you see how that fits now with all the emotion. This isn't about frustration and anger. This is about letting them go into death. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. Inspire us in our thoughts and in our reading and our study and show us where to read and how to understand that we, like the Bereans, as Gabriel mentioned, might really come to know for ourselves personally and that we, we might be used in your hand to share your goodness with others, not with complicated theories and theologies, but with simple, thus saith the Lord, with simple, here's what Jesus said and here's what Jesus did. And, 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 and stop our mouths from always interjecting sort of our, our thoughts and our theories that we, we don't have a thus saith the Lord for. Train us in that way with your grace, your patience, and your love that we might be effective tools to help others. In Jesus' name, amen.